Good evening, folks. We're going to let a few of you trickle in. We just opened the floodgates. And then we'll get started in just a minute. Wow, here we go. You guys were all just right in the waiting room. So exciting. Wow, wow, wow. Well, I am really excited tonight. Um, I am a very much a, a best coast girl. I believe California above everybody. And tonight we are talking California colleges with some of um, my amazing colleagues. So I'm really excited to jump in. Um, a couple housekeeping things, and folks are still trickling in, um, but a couple housekeeping things. We are, we've are we got the chat box open, and so you'll be able to send um, questions as we move through the webinar. You can also use the Q&A function if you've got questions you want to submit along the way. Um, we are recording the session, and so if you, you have to leave early, your internet cuts out anything, you'll, be, you'll have access to the recording within probably 48 hours. We'll share it via email. So no stress about writing down every single wonderful, brilliant thing these folks say. Um, I do want to run through and let everybody introduce themselves. But before I do that, quickly, I want to introduce CollegeWise. Um, we are a national college counseling company, and we, for the last 20-something years, have been helping families navigate the college admissions process, everything from choosing classes to planning summer activities to brainstorming essays and to building college lists um, that don't even all have to be wonderful California schools. So any part of the process, our job is to help families navigate that. I am Allison Lepore. I'm our chief people officer and also a college counselor. And I've been helping families navigate this process for like 15 years. In a previous life, I worked in admissions at the University of Redlands, Go Bulldogs, um, and Red Files on that side. So I have very strong feelings about a lot of stuff we're going to talk about tonight. I would love to um, run around the room and have folks introduce themselves. Joel, I'm going to go to you first because alphabetical was an easy way to choose my next introducer. Hi, everybody. My name is Joel Antiveros, he and him pronouns. Uh, I am also a college counselor at CollegeWise. I have my admissions experience based in the UC system. I worked at UCLA for four years and then an additional year for UC Santa Cruz, go banana slugs. And um, outside of that, uh, studied at the University of Vermont. So I'm native to California, grew up two hours east of LA, got my taste of the East Coast, came back with my tail between my legs after two winters and so excited to be with you all here tonight. Hi everyone, welcome. So excited to chat with you this evening. My name is Margo McCready. I'm a CollegeWise counselor located in our Newport Beach office. Prior to joining the CollegeWise team, I worked on the other side of the desk at the University of Redlands, similar to Allison. Um, we kind of crossed paths at different times. And then after kind of having that small liberal arts style experience, also really wanted to understand the big UC system here in California. So moved over to UC San Diego and worked there for about four years, helped oversee our freshman application review process, trained readers and kind of managed a team and excited to share with you a bit more about that this evening. And I'll pass it over to Nandita. Hi everyone, my name is Nandita Gupta. Um, I am an East Coaster originally, and that's actually where you're finding me right now, but um, I moved to California to work for Stanford University for a number of years, uh, where I was an admission officer. And um, I now work with CollegeWise, working directly with students, helping them navigate this lovely process we call the college application process. And I'm looking forward to answering all your questions today. So this is quite a powerhouse team. I always learn something from this group, so I am excited to jump in. Before we actually start with the hard-hitting questions, I'm going to give them a little time to limber up, and I want to throw a poll out to see who we've got in the room. Um, so if you guys see the poll up on your screen and you can just respond so we know who we're talking to, getting the poll results in real time is very exciting. So we see a lot of juniors, a lot of parents love that. Um, you'll have to relay this information to your students who will half listen to you, because um, so that is what teenagers do. This is great. Okay, a lot of juniors and a number of sophomores, and then we've got some other years in here. Great. So the good thing is that this is going to, I think a lot of what we're going to touch on is going to apply to a lot of you, but in particular, the recent admissions news, I think for juniors, this is going to be really um, relevant and exciting. This is awesome. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so let's jump in. I want to start with a very share these quickly now that I know how to do this. I want to start with a real softball question for the crew. 
um, which is over the last few years, what has changed with um, admissions in California? When we're talking about the UCs, we're talking about Stanford, we're talking about USC. Um, what, what has changed in the last few years? And I actually wanna go to Margo first. Um, what's been the big difference? I think that one of the biggest differences um, that really comes to mind, I think, for a lot of us is, um, especially like on the UC side, and then also some, you know, the CSUs here in California, getting rid of um, the need for standardized test requirements. So UCs are totally test blind. If you took an SAT, you can't even list that on the application anymore. And I think a lot of people maybe thought that that would really change how people review applications. We've always taken a holistic approach. Um, so, you know, GPA, extracurricular activities, personal um, insight questions. There are so many other factors to consider in addition to test scores. Um, but in my opinion, that's really been um, one of the biggest changes since COVID-19. Anybody else want to layer in there? I guess I'll say from the non-UC non side of things, Stanford is still test optional, meaning they will see scores if you elect to send them in, but it is truly test optional. That, it, that means that it's the applicant's choice whether or not to share the scores or not. But like Margot said, our process has always been holistic. And so test scores only formed one piece of the puzzle. And the, and the truth is that we could... Um, piece the puzzle together quite easily without it. So it really is something that I tell students, if it's something that you're proud of and want to share, do. And if you don't, don't. Totally your choice. I'm going to go to Joel for a second and ask you to look into your crystal ball. How does this impact future applicants? So testing is a big shift. Um, the way we look at test scores and build classes, how are you advising younger students to think about this? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm thinking of primarily sophomores and juniors I'm working with right now. Um, there are a lot of students out there and parents, you know, your kids where they're not test takers, right? And by no means do I think any college or university is going to judge a student's application based off of a three or four hour exam. We've always said in the admissions world that your four years of high school is going to be more important than hours on a test. With that said, there are schools kind of coming through the woodwork that are re-requiring those exams a recent one in the past few months has been Purdue. They are a big public serving institution in Indiana, really popular with my Washington kids, not so much my California kids. Nobody wants to go out to the cold, I get it. Um, but that's a school that is now requiring exams starting next year. And so um, we're kind of waiting at CollegeWise. We're trying to assess and see, you know, which schools are going to start re-requiring and if schools are primarily going to stay test optional or test blind, which I think all of us in this space hope for. Um, we're being honest with our students about, hey, if you don't want to take that exam, you don't have to, right? You don't have to spend the time and energy and money required to prepare for those exams because there are a lot of great schools out there that will allow you to not submit a score and go test optional. So those are some of the conversations I have with my kiddos right now. Um, and a lot of them, for a lot of students, it's a big sigh of relief, right? They don't want to think that a three or four hour exam Will help dictate their admissions decisions. So by simply not submitting, I think it allows their process to feel just a little better in general. Yeah, I wish I had not been able to submit my test scores as a high school student. Anybody want to add anything else to that? Thanks, Joel. I actually think this is a great chance for a student to talk to a counselor to really, I, I see some questions in the Q&A about like, well, what scores should I send? And this is really such a case by case evaluation, case by case in terms of student by student and case by case in terms of school by school. So um, this is the kinds of, honestly, these are the kinds of conversations that we have with our students all the live long day uh, in this test optional environment. All the live long day. And thank you for highlighting that. The questions are already coming through in the Q&A, which is so great. Please keep them coming. We will tackle as many as we can. And some that are super specific or student specific, we won't be able to tackle just because they become so individualized. Um, let's do another softball. Let's do another, just a real slow pitch. Um, in California, our in-state institutions, the UC schools and the Cal State schools are very desirable. Um, are in-state students at an advantage or a disadvantage applying to their in-state institutions, to these UCs and Cal States. And I should have, you all look nervous and nobody wants to jump in. Margo, I'm gonna go I to you. Just, I was just gonna say, 
no. Um, at least, you know, on the, I'm thinking the California public side, I mean, they're California public institution. Their main mission is to educate students here in the state of California. Um, but it's also important to have a diverse campus community. And so, of course, they just don't solely want students from California. They want students from, you know, various states and backgrounds, beliefs, education systems, um, international students. And so, of course, there's going to be students coming from outside of California. But oftentimes, I remember getting the question, you know, well, what's the acceptance rate for in-state versus out-of-state? It was honestly pretty <laughs> comparable. Stu um, we would really like review in the context of a student's high school. So we'll get to that later, but what were you doing given the curriculum and the opportunities available to you at your public or private high school in California or your public high school in Washington? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think California students still have you know, a great opportunity. Can we... Tackle that from the other direction, out-of-state kids applying to our California institutions, and maybe Joel will come to you next, and then Nandita, I'll throw you the next one in terms of keeping everybody on their toes. Yeah, again, I'm answering from, from a UC or Cal State perspective. So if you look at, if you're applying from out-of-state, there is there are admission policies at both systems that say out-of-state students have to be performing at the same level, if not higher than the in-state students being admitted to those UC or Cal State campuses. So there is a minimum GPA requirement for out-of-state students that's higher for the UC than for in-state students. Our many students, you know, especially for competitive UCs have much higher GPAs or higher academic records, yes. But that is, that's one thing I'm thinking of too, and here's an important tie-in related to cost and financial aid, right? Is those out-of-state admission offers, if they are made to out-of-state students, the thing that UCs and Cal State struggle with is it's less likely to enroll an out-of-state student versus an in-state student. And this is kind of pig piggybacking off what Margo was talking about. A Californian is more likely to take that offer of admission than an out-of-state student that has to pay upwards of 60K a year for housing and tuition at a UC. So um, those are some of the dynamics I think I help my students navigate when they're considering you know, big public state options in California if they are applying from that state. I'll just throw it really quickly, just yeah. so that everyone knows, um, for the private universities in California, schools like Stanford, USC, um, the Claremont Colleges, um, there is no distinction be between, or there's no special designation of in-state and out-of-state. Every student is always evaluated in the context of their own environment, and there's no special because it's not a public university and, and these schools do not rely on funding from the California government, um, there's no special designation that's given to California students versus not. I think that's such a great point, Anita. And I actually want to step back. One of the questions that came up in the Q&A, so we're talking about California schools in, the, in particular. Obviously, the UC and Cal States are big systems here. And Anita, your experience at Stanford, I've heard of it. Um, but I, I think that part of what we're trying to do tonight is speak broadly to California schools. And so when we're talking about Stanford as an example, or a lot of that applies to a lot of the private institutions who live in state. And so we'll let our experience kind of map across a lot of different um, institutions. Can you talk, and actually Nandita, I'll go to you first, but can you talk about what matters to you as an admissions officer, having represented a private institution, what are you looking at in the admissions process? Who are you to care? What a great question, because it's actually impossible to answer. and. Um, I'll start off by saying that while I am the only panelist that has experience um, that sort of is representing the California privates, I will say very, let me be very clear in saying that no one school can ever speak for another at all. And even as we talk about what matters in our admissions processes or how different files are looked at or read or, the, or anything like that, it will vary institution to institution, whether that school is public or private, even the UCs, each different campus will have its own process. Um, and certainly when you come to the private schools, it's even more individualistic. So um, I, I really do not pretend to speak for anyone, but there are some general distinctions that we can say between publics and privates. Um, but to your question of like what matters, um, you know, what sort of stands out in an application? Well, let me first start off by saying that in some ways, the schools have a lot more in common than they actually have um, different. And by that, I'll say, obviously, we're all, 
Everyone is in the business, and I will say business, of admitting students. So that means first and foremost, the transcript is going to be the most important thing that's always valued. I mean, in terms of um, the courses that a student took in the context of the high school where they were attending and also how they did in those classes. So not strictly the GPA as in like the number, but really more the story that the transcript tells. So, you know, it, it's academics first, absolutely, because college is an academic experience. So you have to be evaluated academically first. Um, and then after that, each school is gonna have its own institutional priorities. Um, and so that's really where I think the diversity starts to come in in terms of what each school is looking for because their institutional priorities vary not only institution by institution, but even sometimes year by year. Um, I think, you know, those of us who have worked in admissions office know the meetings that we have during reading season where, you know, the dean will call in all the admission officers and say like, hey, these are the priorities for this year. And sometimes even as the class is shaping up um, in, you know, in the middle of reading season saying like, hey, we need more students uh, that fit X profile or, you know, we're looking for A, B and C thing. So that's, a, I mean, so I guess that's the most non-answer I can give to a non-question, Allison. Um, but I'll, I'll give, I'll, I'll give my uh, my pan my co-panelists a chance to answer because they probably yeah. answers. Let's see if someone can clean up here. I actually think this is a great distinction because the UCs do have a, a pretty clear um, kind of list of criteria of what they're evaluating. So Joel, can you talk a bit about what the UC evaluation process looks like and maybe what the differences are? Yeah, uh, knowing the sheer number of applications to the UC, they have their own application. It's separate from Common App. And so with that, I think it's just a little bit more efficient and that allows for reading. And Margo and I might speak on reading a little bit more, but um, obviously your academics, as, as both my colleagues have said, reading within the context of the high school, I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing questions in the chat about rigor of curriculum and GPA. Those things are considered by the UCs. It, they're gonna look at a weighted GPA. They're gonna look at an unweighted GPA, but most importantly, how students challenge themselves within the context of their high school. That's a big piece around academics that takes up a lot of application. Then we wanna see how students utilize their time, right? Are they playing a sport? Are they volunteering? Are they leading a club? Are they pursuing interests outside of school? Um, I saw a question about, you know, where do we put summer programs on the application? Truly on the UC application, it's misleading. There's only five or six categories when listing activities, but admission officers just wanna see where students spend their time. Um, and and sure, if you're a leader in an organization or you have you know, high impact in a club or group, that might add a little more value, but I often have heard from students or families ask the question, how many hours of volunteer service do we need to do? Um, that, that's not what volunteering is when the admission officer reads that app. So we just wanna see where students spend their time. You don't have to volunteer. You go get a part-time job and get paid, right? And that's something you can put on the application. And then we might get more deep in the essays later, but we have our personal insight questions in the UC system. And those are really, as I pose it to my students, just a chance for students to explain who they are, to be themselves and treat the questions as written interviews. I studied communications and dance when I was in college. I am not an English reader or proofreader or like, you know, I, I'm not there to analyze a student's writing. I'm there just to get to know them. So when I read for the UC, we want those PIQs to be treated as written interviews. And so those are all the components um, and it's it's hard to go much deeper than that, but those are the things that I think are the most pertinent on the UC app. Can we talk a bit about, can we talk a bit about declaring a major? Um, because there is a lot, I think, of all my students feel like they need to have a major. Um, how important is it, and maybe in particular for highly selective colleges, how important is it to to have a major selected. Margo, can I start with you? Yeah, totally. Um, I think it's kind of, you know, a, a gray area if I'm being completely honest. Um, you know, I've got, I think of one student specifically that I'm working with right now and he's a junior. He knows that he's wanting to apply to the UCs. He's interested in engineering and computer science, which we all know is beyond competitive. So we take the selectivity of the UCs and then we add some of the most popular majors and it just makes it that much more competitive. 
So he and I are kind of navigating, okay, let's really dive into those academic interests. Maybe what are you going to do this summer to kind of explore? Because for him, it's going to be pretty important for the UCs at least to list a major on the application. Um, because if he applies as undecided and goes in his freshman year and then decides, hey, I now know I want to do computer science and tries to switch as a freshman or sophomore, it's going to be really, really challenging. Um, flip side is if you truly are undecided or if you're kind of, you know, interested in some schools that don't have selective majors or that aren't impacted or capped, you are more than welcome to go in as undecided or go in under business like I did years and years ago and then switch into history and political science. Like there's no right way. Um, but just to recap, I guess for UCs, some do admit by major. Some majors are more competitive than others. We've got a great UC guide. I'll try to find it and drop it in the chat. Um, there's an awesome table that we kind of put together that breaks up how each campus reviews by major. And if you're kind of wanting to find that information, the UC guide is great insider info. Pop quiz. Does every, what schools in California will not let you be undecided as an applicant? Friends, this is my favorite, and I'm forcing everyone not to answer so I can know the right answer. Cal Poly San Luis Obispo does not allow students to apply undecided. Everybody comes in and applies directly to their major. So kids who are undecided should not go to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, even though it is beautiful. Um, there are can, I actually, can I just throw in something real quick? Yes. Right? Um, what, something that I tell my students all the time is that undecided does not mean unmotivated. Um, and so even if you are undecided, which is a perfectly fine thing to be, again, depends on the school, clearly not at, at Cal Poly Slow. Um, but for example, at Stanford University, we didn't admit by major. So actually what you put on, you know, what you select as the, you know, your, uh, your top three majors, we know that those are just ideas that you might have. Realistically, I think we were, there are schools have different philosophies on this and Stanford's was definitely, this is an intellectual playground, come here, play for two years and you actually don't have to declare your major until the end of your sophomore year. Now that being said, um, really what colleges are looking for, whether they ask you to declare a major or not, is really to learn more about your intellectual interests and passions and curiosities. And so that's what you wanna highlight, whether you are declaring a major officially or not. I'm I'm still laughing at the thought of Margot as a business major. Uh, that will never not be funny to me. That's like the version of me as a science major. Also a crazy idea. So the chat, there's some interesting chatter in the chat about activities. And so I want to ask, I'm going to ask you a question that's a little bit backwards. What types of activities should students avoid? Are there activities that are bad news you shouldn't do besides crimes? Crimes, any other activities that are avoidable? or that are better? Nandita, I know I said- Okay, yeah, wrong. sorry, I, I know I just spoke last, but I'll, I'll quickly jump <laughs> in to say that um, one of my favorite things to tell students is that colleges don't actually care what you do, they care why you do what you do. And so as such, there's no activity or group or there's nothing that's better, inherently better or worse. Um, but I tell my students all the time, what you need, to, you need to do the hard work of thinking about what matters to you. That's not an easy question to answer. That's not an easy question for adults to answer. That's not an easy question for teenagers to answer. Um, but that is the quest that you're on. And that is what colleges are really trying to figure out uh, about you when you, and so when you showcase to a college, here's how I spend my time when I'm not legally mandated to be in school um, or working on my homework, what you're really saying is here's what matters to me. So make sure that you spend your time doing the things that matter to you because that is uh, what the colleges want to hear about. And so that why becomes a lot easier to articulate when you are in fact doing the things that matter to you because that's what you get to talk about. So what you do matters way less. So you're saying there's not a right activity. You're saying pursue a thing you love. Interesting. I love crazy, it. crazy. I know. Crazy. And here's 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 another crazy thought that I leave with my students. 
if you're doing everything in high school just to get into college, you are robbing yourself of a high school experience. And there are some things that, you know, when, when students are like, I don't know what my passion is, or I don't know what I'm interested in. Sometimes this is a, um, a question that I got from our dear colleague, Amy Chatterjee. Um, she used to ask students, what would you do even if you couldn't put it on your college application? And I really encourage mm -hmm. students to think about that because that can help them lead those meaningful lives. And guess what? Um, engaging in meaningful activities for, the, for yourself is what makes you a, an engaging and compelling applicant for the college. I love that. I love that. Joe, I'm going to come to you next. There are activities and there's some there was some chatter about um, students are hiring consultants to help them start nonprofits and do this thing. I was barely making it to volleyball practice in high school. So these kids, wow, um, great work. Can you talk about do colleges reward students for activities that seem fancier or that expensive summer camp at UCLA or um, is that like are those fancy extracurriculars better? Yeah, I really appreciate that question. It's timely because a lot of my students, they want to pursue let's just use summer as an example they want to pursue those programs that seem lofty are usually expensive what we call in this field the pay to play programs and sure a pre-college program at brown if you want to help identify that academic interest then that could be a helpful way to find an interest right if you can go take a coding course or a deep dive into economics that might help you in figuring out your passion maybe a potential major you'll apply to in the future but in terms of impact and how much it holds or you know, adds value on an application, that doesn't add any more value than the student who I kind of mentioned earlier gets a part time job over the summer, just works 30 hours a week, you know, serving ice cream to kids um, or families or parents, whoever's in the room. And then the other thing I'll add is I, I have one student I'm thinking about who during the pandemic, lots of summer programs, things went virtual online. Well, the student didn't want to do that. And this was a student who was an athlete, he was a volleyball player, and he wanted to start a program just for his local neighborhood to get kids out of the house. And he ran his own sports camp. It's a few weeks long. It was something he got his other buddies and teammates involved with. And only ended up being like 20, 25 neighborhood kids. But that's something, one, he got, it had an impact. Two, he enjoyed it. And three, that is actually the college essay he wrote the most when and working with them this fall on applications because it was something he loved it was something he wanted to do to give back and he didn't get paid for it he ran himself he borrowed sports supplies from the you know local families in the neighborhood but that thing is something that i think is allowing him to show colleges just who he is as a person he enjoyed it he's written about it and he's i mean in terms of admissions he's done well and that's not because of that activity but it's just to show that it's a lot more than just going to these, you know, fancy lofty programs. It's okay to go to those. We still recommend those at CollegeWise. Students still pursue them, but I, we never at CollegeWise want students to think that will give them a higher edge or a better edge in the college application process. It's also not something that's available to every student. And so colleges, I think, are really smart about not um, judging that. Like, what are the things that are in front of you that you can dig into? Um, there's a question in the chat I want to speak to specifically. Video games. I have an eight-year-old Minecrafter. She's very, she shows me all these things she builds. They have libraries. And I think it's, we roll our eyes about video games, kids getting sucked into their video games and not existing in the real world. Does anybody have a great example of a kid whose interest was video games and turn, okay, that's Nandita, can you talk about a student who turned video games into a real thing or a positive sure. thing? This, this was actually a student uh, while I was an admission officer. So this is an applicant that I read, not a student that I worked with. Um, but here was a student who loved video games, not such, you know, an outlier amongst his peer groups, probably. Um, but he started a blog about his video games and video gaming. This is also pre-Twitch, I should say. So this was a bigger, like this was a little bit more rare back then. Um, but he reviewed video games, basically. And um, it, and basically the blog started to catch on and caught and basically became popular enough that video game makers used to send him um, their video games in advance so that he could review them. But basically, I mean, here's a student who really, you know, one of the things that I talk to my students about all the time is, okay, figure out what you love, and then let's talk about how, how we can take it to the next level, how you can really um, make sure that 
you're engaging meaningfully with it and thinking about ways that you can make an impact and, and that it can have an impact on you. And so, I mean, I take no credit for working with the student, but I do remember reading, um, making my presentation to committee and being like, okay, guys, here's a 17 year old boy who loves video games. And they're like, okay. And I was like, just wait. Um, anyway, and, you know, so he, his passion happened to be video games, but he was really thoughtful about how to take it to the next level and really do it in a way that felt authentic to him. And again, I don't think he was doing it I mean, again, when it started, it was probably just like his friends reading, you know, his his blog or whatever, but it, it grew into something because it actually provided value to the gaming world. I love that. And can I quickly tell my own story about a student who I worked with a few years ago who also loved video games. She was an Irish dancer and a gamer. And she was really like, I want to spend my summer playing video games and I'm going to figure out a legitimate way to do it that Allison will say is okay. And she ended up taking a video game design class, a really intensive one where they built a game from scratch and she they designed all the art and they did. And she really got to dive into it. And that I think is a really cool and interesting way to flex. And she wrote some of my favorite essays about, um, she opened up talking about you picture, when you picture a gamer, you picture like a guy with a beard in his mom's basement eating Doritos. But here's who I am and this is what I love and this is why I'm excited about it. I mean, she went to the University of Puget Sound, but a California kid, so we're still keeping it on the West Coast. Um, can we shift gears to a very small topic uh, called essays? I want to start with my UC fam. I want to start with the PAQ. So just fun fact for the crowd, many colleges require an essay, a personal statement. The UCs are unique and special in that instead they look for four short answer questions called personal insight questions or PAQs. Um, so UC, UC crew, um, is the first PIQ the most important because it's the first one you read? Do you pay the most attention to that and then ignore everything else? Joel? No, I'll let Margo take that one. I was just going to yell no at the top of my <laughs> lungs. <laughs> and do you read all of the PIQs? No, do you read every single kid, every single answer? Yes, they yes. nod. Sorry. Yes, we do. Yeah. And that's... Just, and that, that, and I think Nantija will say this from the private side and the experience as well, like that is the part where we feel like we're finally getting to hear from a student. At least that was always my favorite part of the application, right? A GPA, yes, the activities give us a little bit more, but then when you get to hear direct, directly from the student, I, I think a, a thing we often have said in the admissions world is folks think and students think that admission officers are just evil people with this big deny stamp and we can't wait to use it. But the truth of it is we're looking for reasons to admit students. And so those PIQs, where we really get to know the student and the person that we're hopefully admitting to our campus. Um, so yes, I, I used to spend, I'm sure every person who's worked in admissions spends every you know second and minute of their time reading that app to make sure they review the essays or PIQs. So I'm going to go, I'm going to ask all three of you, I'm going to go Margo Nandita and then back to Joel. Um, I would love for you to share one piece of advice, one tip for students approaching the essay. Um, besides don't, don't write the essay that Margo's had to read a hundred thousand times. So what would you, what's your advice to students about writing? I think I would say, like, sound like yourself. We expect this to be written by a high school student. We're not expecting, you know, a perfect personal insight question. Um, I'll, you know, Nandita will speak more to the personal statement, um, but for the PIQs, like they're short, kind of quickly get to the point, tell us what you need to say, um, address the prompt, you know, in your first line or two, and then back it up with like two examples, highlighting, um, you know, the, the impact or what you've learned or your interests, and then move on to the next one. Um, and yeah, my biggest piece is, is sound like yourself. We want to know who you are. We want to see your character and, and personality come through. Um, Margo, I, I totally agree. Um, so the personal statement is a little different than the PIQs that the UCs ask for. Uh, the personal statement is that sort of archetype college essay, the 500 word, approximately 500 word essay, um, although it can take many uh, shapes and forms, of course, but in general, so one piece of advice that I give my students is, especially because it's, 
hmm, when obviously also this is going to depend school to school, but at a school like Stanford and many privates, the um, personal statement is going to be one essay of a number of other essays as well. And so I really encourage my students to think about their application as a whole. So think like an admission officer. Now, an admission officer is seeing your entire application, including some parts that you can't see yourself, like your letters of recommendation, let's say. Um, but try to see how your personal statement works in conjunction with everything else that they're seeing. So make sure that it's not repeating information that they already could get from other parts of the application, um, but make sure that it is in fact, really highlighting something that you wanna highlight that you think um, pairs well with, um, with the rest of your application. So kind of take a bird's eye view a little bit. I guess my last piece of advice would just be try not to overthink it. Like the amount of essays I'm sure my colleagues here see that was, you know, an AP English assignment for a junior. And then the student said the teacher thought was great. That's awesome. Maybe, but if that teacher didn't work in a college admissions office, like I, I think a lot of the times we, again, aren't looking for the flowery writing to see how good of a writer you are. We just want to hear about you as a student. So don't overthink it. I used to give advice like, have multiple people read it. And then I realized that was just a lot for students. And maybe having that friend or that brutally honest family member who can read it and go, this doesn't sound like you. And then that one person to just do a quick grammar check, make sure it's clean and makes sense. Um, that's that's as much energy students need to be putting into like re-reviewing it. Definitely please don't be rewriting essays. Usually your first instinct of what to write about is probably what you should put on paper in an application for us. I love that. Allison, do you have anything to add? Oh, I would love to add one additional piece, which is, I think that a lot of times in essays, teenagers, you're worried about um, impressing the admissions officers because you feel like these really like fancy people wearing tweed jackets, sitting around like an oak conference table debating this stuff. But these human faces that you're looking at are the people who are reading those applications. They're real people who were 17, who also couldn't find their locker in 10th grade. Like those things are all true about these folks. They're not mythical. Um, beings, and they like 17 year olds. And so hearing about the things you care about, hearing about the things that, you know, the imperfections or whatever, the actual human that you are is what's really exciting. Nobody is, and disagree with me if you want guys, but nobody is in admissions for the money. They're in admissions because they like 17 year olds, which is parents of 17 year olds are going, why? That's insane. And I agree. Um, quick question, curveball. Are we worried about chat GPT? As an admissions officer, Joel's Joel's doing a head wobble. Let me go to you first, sir. I don't think so. I think there recently just came out that student who's like built a software to analyze and figure out if it's actually sourced from ChatGBT. Um, I I think it for any student or family who like thinks that's a good idea. I I think you're just putting yourself at risk. It, the thing about even working at UCLA is we had. We had many admission readers, but every application was reviewed at least two times. And that if anything was ever off when I read apps, I could mark it for another review. Hey, let's go put this through and just double check. And in my five years working for the UC, happened a handful of times where I I was able to feel my spidey senses go off. We'd check an essay and it was a essay student stole off the internet or was copied from another peer. So I wouldn't I, I wouldn't risk the chances of admission regardless of whether it's going to get through or not. And also you're doing yourself a disservice, right? You're not actually talking about who you are as a student to the campus. And that's more important because you want to make sure you're portraying your true self. I have, I have a hot take. I am glad for chat GPT. And here's why, because when I'm working with students, um, and this comes from the perspective of somebody who has read 35,000 essays, that's actually like the real number. Um, you know, sometimes before chat, P ch ch chat GPT, um, a student would send in an essay, like, you know, when, like that were brainstorming, blah, blah, blah. And I, you know, it's, it's sort of fine. It like hits all the main points maybe, but there's just something missing. And um, I'd have to think about how to artfully tell them like, you're not wrong, but this is not right either. And now I can just say, this sounds like ChatGPT wrote it. And I will say right now, because what is ChatGPT? It is the voice of the internet. ChatGPT 
is not a person, it's not a robot, it is a language processing tool, and it processes the, the voice of the internet. Guess whose voice that isn't? It's not your voice, which means that it might have all the right information, but it will not be written in a way that sounds like you. And um, I, if your essay sounds like chat, maybe you should ask people if this sounds like chat GPT wrote it, you're going to need another edit. The, the other thing I'll throw in here is um, parents, you know, when your teenager is up to trouble, some, some, they've done something and there's no evidence, but your spidey senses have just gone off. I think admissions officers are like that. Having read so many thousands of essays, like you said, Nandita, it is very easy to identify a voice that isn't a 17 year old. Um, and I, when I was in admissions, there were students I denied because I knew that this was not an essay they wrote. And I think to Joel's point, it's just, is it worth the risk? Um, instead, present yourself, your authentic, wonderful self, and let colleges say yes to that kid. And the ones who don't, that's their loss. Um, speaking of file reading, an activity I do not miss. I'm curious, uh, Nandita, I'm going to come to you first, and then um, I'm going to come to Joel. But how long did you spend reading an actual application? We've talked about multiple reads, but you, as a single reader, how much time did you spend reviewing a file? Well, uh, that uh, we were just kind of talking about our admission officer days. I will say your first year. You are so slow, so <laughs> slow, and you are buried under files. I used to work in investment banking and I put in more hours my first year reading files because I was so slow. Um, and then you learn how to get quick. And, and by that, I mean, you start getting efficient and you start understanding um, as you work for your institution for more and more years, you really start to understand, like I said, the institutional priorities, you know how committee is going to go. So you have a sense of who's actually going to be competitive in the process and who's not, even though the vast majority of applicants are truly wonderful. Um, and so I will say, uh, I'll give a range at the high end of the range, let's say it's a transfer applicant who maybe is like, 10 to 15 years out of high school, had a very checkered past, that kind of thing, that might take me upwards of half an hour just to really like piece together what happened and when, and then they were in the military and then they did, you know, that kind of thing, um, to as quick as maybe somewhere around uh, like under 10 minutes, maybe seven to nine minutes or so when you can kind of quickly understand. Um, but, and, and that being said, that is with reading every single word, meaning reading all the essays, reading the letters of recommendation. Um, you just learn how to be quick, honestly, that's, and you start to understand um, who is really, who you're going to be able to make a case for in committee and who is not, even though they are a wonderful applicant. Oh, and I actually, I say that number, I, I know like seven minutes might sound like insanely little um, to read the sort of like 50 or so pages that comprise um, an application. Uh, but I say that also just so that students really understand that what, if in the case that they submit and they find afterwards, oh my God, I didn't put a period at the end of that sentence or oh, I didn't capitalize the I. Doesn't matter. Does not matter inconsequential. Uh, obviously proofread your application, but if something slips by, that's totally okay. It's not going to be a problem. Joel, how long did you spend reading an application? Allison's asking me this because she knows I'm a slacker. So uh, <laughs> similarly, Nandita, the first year, yeah, I would say first two years, you're spending a lot more time. You're getting used to the process. Mm -hmm. If it helps provide numbers when I think about my time at UCLA, we're reading 50 to 60 applications a day, right? Each app is read at least twice. There's over 250 to 300 readers in those offices. Those are facts the admissions office will tell you, right? Um, those first years, yeah, 10 to 15 minutes. And I already named like the UC applications a little slimmer and more efficient than some common applications. No layers of rec, right? It's mostly those PIQs, academics activities. A poorly done application, and I didn't name this to my colleagues earlier, I could get through those in two minutes, right? Those are the students who aren't utilizing their word count on the PIQs. They're filling out the application very lacklusterly. So there are applications I've read very quickly, right? I think the checks and balances that the UC has, and Margo can expand on this, having, you know, helping lead that eval team at UC San Diego, is it's always going to be touched at least twice in major I think all of the UC campuses. But then for those cases where maybe two readers disagreed on that admission decision, 
they're going to throw it to a third person, maybe a fourth person. And then we also have quality reviews that happen, or we, we had quality reviews that would happen after students had been slated to be ad admitted, waitlisted, or denied. So the UC does as good a job as possible. I don't know how you make that system more efficient for a holistic review. Um, and I know folks, I think the last thing I'll note that hopefully Nandita was starting to allude to as well, is this is to hopefully show you like that no, any student that applies to a UC could succeed at those campuses. They could academically achieve, they would do well at those schools. And so by no means should it deny from any of those campuses, not just UCs, but any private schools, any Cal States in California, doesn't mean you're a bad student, right? It just truly shows how many other students are interested. And it's not indicative of how great a student you're gonna be or how successful you'll be. That I'm flashing back to my file reading days. I wanna to touch a little bit quickly. The UCs do not require recommendation letters. We're not gonna get into recommendation letters today. We do webinars like this 17 times a week. Um, and so there'll be webinars where we're diving deeper into some of those topics, letters of recommendations. One of them, we can talk for hours about essays. Um, but tonight I'm gonna to forge ahead. Um, and I wanna talk about demonstrated interest. Um, and I want to then talk about, um, I want to tack legacy onto that. So demonstrated interest, um, which when we talk about demonstrated interest, any any kind of engagement with a college, a lot of times the obvious way to do that is in is college visits. Are college visits important? And Nandita, I want you to answer for all private schools in the state of California. And then Margo, I'm going to have you tackle this for our UCs. Um, Nandita, you first. Are sure. visits uh important? Spoiler alert, it depends on the school. So there are schools for whom demonstrated interest is very important because they really want to make sure they are admitting the students that they feel confident are serious applicants and really will attend, you know, will want to attend their university. Um, and other schools such as Stanford that do not take into consideration demonstrated interest at all. Now, when I say that a school does not take into consideration demonstrated interest, I mean they it does not uh, track if you visited campus, if you email your admission officer, if you uh, attended the info session or whatever it might be. But what I do tell students is all, all schools are looking at whether you're a serious applicant. So when a Stanford applicant went on and on about um, how they wanted to study nursing as an undergraduate, I would say, hmm, this student has not done their research on this institution because we do not have a nursing major. So the school may not track demonstrated interest, but you have to do your research into each institution and really think about why you're applying because every school is indirectly asking about that, you know? So do your research. It takes more time than you think, but it also should be more fun than you think. So um, you should enjoy it. Margo, can you answer that question on behalf of all public schools in the state of California? Yeah. Just to do so, a little generalizing. Yeah, no. UCs and CSUs don't consider demonstrated interest whatsoever. Um, if you go on a visit, if you, you know, take a virtual tour online or sign up for their mailing list, that's only going to benefit you in kind of making your decision on, you know, hey, am I really interested in this school? Do I want to take the time to apply? Um, you know, what do I like about it? What am I drawn to? But they won't see at all. Um, when I was at University of Redlands, I don't, this was years and years ago, so I don't know if they still do, but when reviewing the application, I could see what events students had signed up for um, to see, oh, have they really engaged with us? Do they really know our school? Are we kind of a match? But with UCs and CSUs, that's not the case at all. And where, well, maybe just a nod of your head. Leg, so legacy admission is the idea that somebody in your family went to this institution and so you are a legacy. Did legacy um, matter at your institution? No for Margo, no for Joel, and then nod for Nandita. Nandita, can you quickly speak to how legacy fit into the evaluation? So I'll speak really quickly and say that every school defines legacy in its own way. So that's really important to remember. Um, at Stanford, when I was there, it was strictly if a parent or step parent, notice I did not say grandparent. I did not say aunt and uncle. I did not say cousin. I did not even say older brother or sister. Um, uh, received an undergraduate degree 
at Stanford University. So not a business degree, not a medical degree, not a residency fellowship, not a whatever it might be. So each school is going to define it specifically. Um, and I will also say that we are on the cusp of a Supreme Court decision that will impact how these kinds of special consideration is given to groups. So stay tuned, folks, because that may really change. We are getting, there are really some really great questions coming through, and I'm feeling like I wish we had scheduled this webinar for 10 to 12 hours so we could dig into a lot of these. Like I said, webinars are happening with us all the time and diving into some of these specific topics and specific schools. Um, I think for specific situations, those become really individualized, um, but I would love to quickly talk about, it's March 8th. The vast majority of folks in this webinar are juniors or families of juniors who are approaching this process. What is one piece of advice you have for students who are going to apply to college this fall? Um, and I'm going to start with you, Margo, and then I'll go to Joel, and then I'll go to Nandita. Um, I think I would really, oh, you put me on the spot quick. I think I would really consider or start to consider who you are, what you like to do, um, inside the classroom, in your free time, the kind of environment you like to be in and think about like who you are organically, maybe before building your college list. Don't just choose schools because they're selective or the they're the ones that you've heard the most about or your, your friends are applying there. Yeah, there's a chance, you know, that you will apply to many of those schools, but there are outstanding colleges here in California that we haven't even like named in today's presentation too. Um, UCs are amazing, but they're not the end all be all in my opinion, especially as they've become more and more selective. Um, you can get amazing education at the UCs or at other institutions here in California as well. Um, so uh, look holistically at this process. Yeah, I was at California that only applied in state. And the reason I have this job now is because I live vicariously my, through my Californians applying out of state, right? Like there are schools out there that are just a blast and they can be at the same price point as a UC and Cal State. That was a big driving force for me. I didn't know it at the time, wish I would have known that. What I'm actually gonna answer for that question, Allison, I'm gonna put the academic spin on it. I'm seeing a lot of Q and A about like rigor of curriculum, APs, juniors, you gotta finish off this semester strong, right? Um, this is probably the last semester in terms of grades that many colleges will utilize when they look at your applications when they calculate that GPA. It, UCs, a lot of schools with November deadlines will just use 10th and 11th grade. There are private institutions that will look at 9th through 11th, but if you're applying for early action or early decision in November, they're only going to see your rigor of curriculum in senior year. They're not actually going to see the grades you're getting in those classes. So finish this year off strong. Um, and to re-emphasize what we've already said, a lot of folks asking about how many APs do I need to take them? It's about how you challenge yourself within this context of your school, right? I, the students you always hear about, the kid who got it denied from all the UCs and they had a 4.0 GPA, well, were they at a school that had 15 to 20 AP offerings and did they take any, right? So finish off this semester strong, continue to show colleges that you want to push yourself in senior year, but make sure to not over challenge yourself as best as possible. Um, I'm going to give two pieces of information. Um, uh, so for the students, uh, I think I talked about this a little bit before, but that is that um, you really want to spend your time, give yourself, start this, for, especially if you're a junior right now, start this process in your junior year in terms of doing the research mm -hmm. into the institutions that exist out there. And the best thing you can do at the very beginning is to keep as open a mind as possible. So sure, research the schools that you've heard about, guess what? Research some schools that you haven't heard about also. Make sure you read your college guidance counselors, like if they have a bulletin or see what college fairs might be coming into your area or sign up for one online. There's so many different options. Keep an option, keep an open mind. The better research you do, the smoother the process will go. I tell my students all the time, I think families hire me, families hire us because they think it's going to be like a uh, 
90 million hours of working on essays. And I will tell you the amount that we work on essays pales in comparison um, to the amount that we spend researching colleges, because that's the best thing that you can do for yourself and secondarily for your application. After good research yields a great list, um, a great balanced list. And that um, when, when students have a dream list, not just a dream school, but a dream list, um, the essays really flow quite naturally and don't actually take that much time. And dare I say, can even be fun. And in fact, if you work with a college wise counselor, we're gonna make it fun. <laughs> um, okay, but my second piece of advice is actually for the bigger audience that we have, which is the parents. Um, and this is, since it's, since it's majority parents, I will say, here's some advice for you. And um, that is that, you know, you kids, teenagers don't generally listen to what their parents say. And that's true, but they're always watching you. They are always watching you. Um, I, I've been doing this now for 19 years. I know my skincare is amazing. <laughs> um, but I will say that, I mean, my first set of students are well beyond uh, their undergraduates, they have PhDs, they have families of their own, you know, all that kind of thing. I will tell you, no student remembers where they did or did not get in early decision or early action or where else. Nobody remembers that. They do remember how their parents made them feel throughout the process. So think carefully about that, because that is something that you kind of have one chance to get right. And I'm really going to encourage you to watch your facial uh, expression, um, you know, to work with counselors to figure out how to make sure that you can be as supportive for your student because this is such a trying time for them and when you can make them feel loved supported and that they can conquer the world regardless of what any school says in terms of an admit or deny letter um, that's when you're doing best by them and that is what they will take and cherish for the rest of their lives not where they got in you're making me feel a little weepy i've got an eight-year-old and now i'm really feeling like i want to get this right with her um, I just threw up a poll. Uh, if you've got additional questions, I know we were only able to get to 60 questions, which means we were answering a question a minute throughout this webinar, um, but still a bunch we couldn't get to. If you have additional questions, if you're in a situation where you need some really specific advice and working with one of our counselors makes sense, please feel free to um, let us know. I will also say that part of um, Part of what's really exciting about this process is that students have options to consider. We are in a state, we are in California, we're considering a state where we have, we have so many really, really phenomenal institutions. And we spend a lot of energy and we spend a lot of airtime here talking about Stanford, talking about UCLA, talking about Berkeley, talking about some of these schools that are highly selective. Those places are great and give great experiences to their kids, but they're not the right place for every single student. And probably one of the more frustrating parts of this webinar was that it depends. Every single institution is different. Every single institution has different institutional priorities and things that they care about. And guess what? Villanova does care about community service and other schools are not going to worry about it as much. Um, the same thing is true of your kids. And so this is one of, not the first times, my third grader feels like a very individual special snowflake, but I think this is a, a place where you really do need individual advice and an individual plan for your kid and your family, whether that's coming from your counselor, counselor at school or somebody like us. The families who approach this process um, with more knowledge and more fact-based knowledge are more empowered and have a more pleasant process, whether or not Nadit is forcing you to have fun, have a more pleasant process. There are great colleges out there for every single kid who wants to go. And I am excited, especially for you juniors who are going to jump into this process next. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. The webinar recording will follow in the next 48 hours or so. Um, you can feel free to reach out to us. And if you've requested more information, we will follow up with you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to these panelists and thanks to Charlie, who has been doing the Lord's work in the Q&A. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Have a good one. <laughs>